Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this exciting episode, we're going to look at a question that you may have had when you've been layering views. Now, there are many ways of layering views on top of one another, but one way of doing that is by using a Z stack, and another is to use the overlay and or background modifiers on a view. Here's some code that demonstrates these two approaches, where I'm layering and offsetting colored squares on top of each other so you can see how they relate to one another as far as depth is concerned. I've got a convenience function that we'll be using going forward to create colored squares. And in the top example, I'm creating a stack of them using overlay and background. And below that, I'm creating a similar looking result by using a Z stack, as in the ordering of the depth of each view is the same. I'll be leaving a link to the source code used in this episode down in the description, a description which is in close proximity to the like button. So if you're feeling generous, go ahead and hit that while you're down there. Now, when using the first approach, the topmost view will be defined by the last overlay modifier in the hierarchy. And the bottommost view is defined by the last background modifier. So you can mix and match where you're defining these layers. While I could make it somewhat clearer by grouping them, the result would still be one where you have to work out the ordering. The second approach, on the other hand, is defined within a Z stack, which simply applies the painter's algorithm to determine the depth ordering of the views, which means the bottommost views are defined first and additional views are layered on top. Personally, I think the Z stack example is easier to reason about as you can visually see exactly where each view resides from bottom to top. But what's the difference between these two techniques? And why would you use one in favor of the other, since both of them appear to produce the same result? Well, there are two main differences, one behavioral and one functional. Setting the spacing on this VStack to zero gives us a clue about the behavioral difference. See how the bottom example is barging in on the top one? To explore this, here's an example where I've got a convenience function that generates a pattern of red squares surrounding our hero view. At this starting point, that's a yellow square. Now let's add a background view. We'll call this big square, which is a square, and we're going to give it a white color with an opacity of 0.5, so we can see what's beneath it, and a size of 200. And now we'll add it as a background to the center square. As you can see, the white square overlays the top and left red squares, but is under the right and bottom ones. This is due to the order in which these are defined in the function that generates the pattern. That's perfectly normal, but what I want you to focus your attention on is that the relationship to the center square of the surrounding red squares has remained intact, which means the frame presented by the center square is the same as it was before, regardless of the fact that we have added a bigger square as a background. Now let's look at an example that uses a Z stack in an attempt to achieve the same thing. Since the Z stack uses the painter's algorithm to determine the depth sorting, we add the big white square as a background by placing it before the center square there. And look what's happened. The big white square has pushed aside the surrounding squares. And this is because the Z stack will size its frame according to the requirements of the views inside. So the frame of the Z stack is being pushed out to accommodate the big square. Therefore, the difference in these two approaches, other than clarity concerns, is that when using overlay and background modifiers, the frame of the modified view remains unchanged, which could be an important consideration when defining your layouts. What if we wanted to make a Z stack behave like that? Well, in this case, we could simply set the frame of the Z stack to be the same size as the center square by saying frame 100. And now the result we get is exactly the same. That's all well and good, but we might not know the size of that view. If we really wanted to do this more generally, we could do it like this. We could set a state private variable up here, which is going to hold the size of it, and then set that within a geometry reader modifier like this. Geometry reader, geo, which is the geometry proxy, and then set the size to the size of that geometry proxy. And then we finish by setting the frame to that size. And then after resuming, we can see that it behaves exactly the same way. Interestingly enough, that geometry reader modifier, which is defined in the pure Swift UI package, works based on the principle that the overlay and background modifiers work within the confines of the frame of the view being modified. So it's quite relevant to today's discussion. 
I go through an implementation of that modifier in detail in an episode I did a while back on geometry readers, so take a look if you're interested. Let's have a look at the functional difference that I mentioned earlier. Let's say we had another square, a smaller one this time, so we'll call it little square, which is a square, we'll make it blue with a size of 50. And I'm going to overlay this onto the center square, but this time I'm going to give it an alignment of top leading. As we probably expect by now, it aligns within the frame of the center square. It's a little trickier to do this with a Z-stack. The immediate thing you might reach for in the useful draw is to give the Z-stack an alignment of top leading, right? Alignment, top leading. And we already have a problem. Even though we have given the Z-stack an external frame of size, its extent still includes the big semi-transparent white square. So the center square has aligned itself with that. Let's keep plowing forward though, and while I wouldn't recommend doing this, if we were really intent on recreating this look with a Z-stack, we could give the big square a frame of size as well. So the Z-stack sees this frame when defining its extent. Now the center square is back in place and we can add the little square here. And now we again have parity with the top pattern. The Z-stack version is hanging on by the skin of its teeth, albeit in a fairly inelegant way. But now we're going to deliver the hammer blow, moving into territory that is not reachable by a single Z-stack. I'm going to add another little square overlay, but give this one an alignment of bottom trailing. And we can do this because we are allowed to control the alignment of each overlay and background modifier individually. Since the alignment in the bottom example is defined on a per Z-stack basis, the only way of recreating this pattern using Z-stacks is to use another Z-stack. One approach would be to place the center square and that little square in their own Z-stack, give that one an alignment of bottom trailing, and then place another little square under that. And there we are, we've done it again. But the whole point of using a Z-stack is to improve clarity, and I think you'll agree this approach doesn't do that. So ultimately, which one you pick comes down to the technique that produces the greatest clarity given the result that you're trying to achieve. And now that you know the difference between these two methods, you can make a more informed decision as to which one to use. If you found that useful, please do hit that like button. It really does help the channel. And let me know what you think. Do you think we should use Z-Stacks where possible, or do you find the overlay slash background approach clearer? And if you want to see more of this kind of thing, do consider subscribing. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.